Thank you for joining us and welcome everyone. Um, I'm Cliff Lynch, the director of CNI, and you've arrived at one of the project briefing sessions in the third week of our um, virtual spring 2020 member meeting. Today, we have a presentation on a really interesting and important topic, which is how to deal with experiential research and scholarship. Um, uh, the entire sort of chain of, um, of managing uh, that kind of material. We have two speakers, Mika Vandegrift and Shelby Holman, uh, both from the North Carolina State um, University Libraries. And um, they'll, be, they'll give us a presentation. Then we'll take uh, questions and answers at the end. Um, is, as questions occur to you during the presentation, there is a Q&A tool at the bottom of your screen. And please feel free to enter questions at any time as they occur to you during the presentation. Um, when our two speakers are finished, Diane Goldenberg Hart from CNI will materialize and um, moderate the uh, Q&A session. And with that, uh, let me just thank our presenters and thank you for joining us. And I believe uh, Shelby is going to lead off. So over to you. Thank you, Cliff. Um, hi, everyone. Thank you for joining us remotely today. Um, Mike and I are going to talk about the Immersive Scholar Grant and particularly look at development, documentation, display, and dissemination of experiential research and scholarship. Uh, we have a lot of project project documentation through our website at immersivescholar.org um, and Micah has shared that link in the chat. And we also have a repository of the different documentation and project outputs within an OSF repo that's also accessible um, through the link. So this presentation is going to be split into two parts. Um, I'm going to give a pretty quick overview of the grant, some of the outcomes and lessons that we've learned, and then Micah is going to focus on the theoretical frameworks and practices that we applied. So to give some context, what is Immersive Scholar? Since the Hunt Library opened in 2013, we've been able to move beyond the initial installation and adoption of our high-tech environments, such as our Teaching and Vis Lab shown here, to think more broadly about the potential of these immersive environments. This led us to the realization that the utilization, scale, and impact of visualization environments and the scholarship created within them is limited due to a number of factors. And having identified this problem in 2016, the libraries proposed and received a grant specifically focused on addressing this problem statement, which led to the Visualizing Digital Scholarship in Libraries and Learning Spaces grant, um, also known as Immersive Scholar. This is through the Andrew W. Mellon Foundation. It's a three-year grant. Um, we are in the third year currently, and it's $414,000 and focuses on two key areas. The first is developing a community of practice. Hunt Library is not alone in implementing custom technology. Every institution utilizes different programs and approaches to maintaining and using their environments, with most ins institutions operating independently, which is partially due to the relative newness of hosting such technologies. And so we ask the question, how can we connect with other groups and share knowledge? We also wanted to look at technical and resource barriers that limit participation and impact. Since each display is unique, the program and support must be individually crafted, requiring each institution to employ experts in specific technical skills um, or other areas to maintain these walls. And additionally, funding for both the maintenance and content creation for these environments is expensive. Um, we're pretty lucky at NC State, we have some really great creative students and researchers that help us create custom content, but every piece is really time consuming um, and requires really particular skill sets. And so that leads to limited content being created. So to address these two areas, the grant was split into five main components. Um, first was gathering together a group of experts within visualization to form an advisory panel. Second was funding uh, subgrants at five different institutions, which I'll discuss in a second. Uh, we hosted a goal setting workshop in December of 2017 to determine priorities for the overall grant and for the subgrants. We also hosted three creative residencies at NC State, which I'll also touch on in a minute. And then finally, we, we hosted the LibRAC 2019 conference to pull together the broader community to discuss um, work that will continue in this field. 
So what did we accomplish with this project? This project is multi-layered in terms of the project, products, and principles. It's also multi-institutional and multifaceted. So there were quite a few outputs, and so I'm not going to go into detail about any of them, but to just give a sense. Um, first, the subgrant projects. So five different institutions completed projects with the goal of either lowering the barriers to access or building a community of, of practice. Um, this was financially the largest part of the grant. And we have project details available at our website, um, immersivescholar.org slash tools. And to give um, two examples, at Indiana University, they created the Collectome, which is a content sharing platform to facilitate the use of tiled video walls or similar large format displays. Um, another example is at VCU, they focused on creating a suite of tools for institutions that are looking to formalize their own spaces and services, such as a best practices for local needs assessment um, and conducting external visits. And then um, in addition to managing the grant, NC State's largest contribution was hosting three creative residencies. Um, each of these had the goal of sharing the work that was created openly with interested institutions and every residency focused on creating digital data-driven pieces for immersive or large-scale environments. So for instance, some examples include um, Coated Glass by Lissa Fleur that created digital stained glass pieces based on Me Too March signs. Um, community Gardens by Lucas Swick, which are generative gardens based on um, data from a housing and food insecurity survey given to NC State students and Surface Tension by Caitlin and Misha that used USGS um, data to investigate the human interaction with water. And so in addition to the outputs from the residencies and from the subgrants, we also had a number of overarching project outputs, um, which include testing frameworks, recommendations for describing scholarship to help um, with evaluating and giving credit to the scholarship that's created in these spaces, and also guidance on hosting your own experiential scholarship projects. Um, all of these are available through our website or through the OSF. So to shift gears a little bit to think about how we accomplished all these different components within this three year time. Uh, we employed a number of different approaches um, and two that I want to highlight really quickly. The first was to use a, a team based approach. Um, what we did was integrate a core management team. So on this, this screen, uh, we have the five current personnel um, that are involved with the core management team as well as past contributors and advisors. And so we use that team to really think about um, the overall timeline, making sure that we are hitting the goals, thinking longer term, and also managing the components, and mix that with functional teams to support specific projects. Uh, this image is from one of our residencies. And so you can see there are four different groups that were helping to support the artist during her time here in creating her work. So this helped encourage agility and lessen time demand on specific individuals. We also mixed together flexibility with rigidity. Uh, with so many concurrently running components, we had to set milestones to stay on track, but we also needed to be flexible in how those milestones were accomplished. And we found that by doing this, it really encouraged a lot of creativity and offered up new forms of experimenting with the scholarship or the way that we can work within these technologies. And then we learned quite a few lessons over these past three years um, and to limit it to the top three lessons that we learned. The first is considering sustainability. Um, during this project, we had a, um, a few staff that um, either changed roles or shifted positions. And so it made it really necessary to think about what is the sustainability of managing a project like this with so many components at the same time. And so as the grant went on, we shifted um, the management approach to try and lessen the time burden on contributing staff and ensure that the project lead and the project manager had um, dedicated time to be able to work on the grant. So this helped and it actually is helping a lot right now too as we are adapting currently and extending the grant a little bit to be able to accomplish the final components. We also thought about um, and learned a lot about considering sustainability surrounding content. There are multiple creators and owners in this situation. And so with so many different projects and content types, we had to ask a lot of questions about who maintains these products over time, um, especially using this technology. And we learned to consider the means of displaying this content. Um, these environments um, and the scholarship created within are really unique experiences and how can we capture that especially once the technology needs to be refreshed or starts to fail or is eventually phased out. 
And so we don't have a firm solution to that, um, but we have learned to really think about these questions and try and build them into the guidelines or workflows that we establish at the beginning of a project. We also uh, learn to consider scalability early and often. Um, at the heart of this grant is sharing content amongst different partners. And so we had to think, um, how do you go from displaying something at one location to displaying it at multiple locations? And it's really important to think about what does that require? Um, what are the dependencies? What components are necessary? And thinking through, will other institutions have access to the same software or expertise to put these things in place? And so that meant having a lot of conversations with partners, thinking through how we, our workflows work in terms of implementing these content at our university, let alone another university. We also learn to consider scalability when it comes to resource allocation. Uh, for instance, that example from earlier with the functional team, that translated in 13 staff that were actively involved in the project. And that's not counting other staff members who maybe came and supported particular components in smaller ways. And so if we were to grow the number of residencies, it's not possible to dedicate enough staff to do that really quickly. Um, and so we had to learn to do really thoughtful project scope and intentional growth to ensure longer term contribution. And we actually implemented this through two local residencies that we hosted um, separate from the project, but with the same team to look at how could we continue this on um, beyond the, the timeline of the grant. And then finally, um, we learned to really think thoughtfully about um, implementing guidelines and workflows. So not only for the team um, in terms of staying on track and meeting our markers for success, but also thinking about the products that came out, uh, making sure that individual subgrants are sharing common expectations to help facilitate that sharing and also thinking about evaluating such different outputs from, the, from residencies or from institutions to ensure that there is credit and evaluation. So with that, I'm gonna turn it over to Micah. Micah. Yeah, thanks Shelby. So, um, and, and that, that's a, a great foundation and uh, the background of, of the project almost to the point where we are right now. Uh, and I'll, I'll back up a little bit and say that um, th throughout the project in, in the middle, we started to, um, look at some of the opportunities that we had since we were working in, in a sort of um, uh, a broader space than we had originally thought. Um, so I'm, uh, what you see on the screen is a reiteration of that, that core principle that we kept going back to that was in the original narrative that um, through lowering the, the technical um, barriers to this kind of work, we're we are creating a space or the, the possibility to increase the impact of these environments and also the works that are created in them. So that, that allowed us to, to sort of move into a new thought space where um, the form of work that we are working with exists almost entirely outside of what we had been, what we have in libraries called scholarly communication for a long time. Um, mainly the, the journal and monograph text based um, scholars communicating to one another. And really what we were functioning in is a space that was much more akin to public scholarship or media arts. Uh, and so the phrase that we've started to use is this is communicated scholarship, um, not necessarily a scholarly communication in the way that we've traditionally um, thought of it. Um, so we were also thinking about what opportunities does that afford us uh, in terms of rethinking digital scholarship overall as it's uh, s slowly grown in our field. Um, and what we realized is that the kinds of works that we were creating are meant to be experienced that the Hunt Library uh, and also our cohort partners, um, immersive or large scale spaces or um, virtual reality as it was included through a, um, kind of grew in, in impact over the course of our three years that that is um, that requires a physical environment. So it is digital scholarship, but uh, we're also thinking in an analog or a situated or a physical space uh, that is also predicated on the, the uh, user and in-person ex experience. So what's been helpful for us is to start thinking about borrowing many different bits from many corners of library work to make what we're calling this, this patchwork quilt of good practices that are allowing us to think about how we want to increase the impact, not just of the environments, but also of the scholarship created within them. So I'll go through four different um, corners of, of library land where we're borrowing some ideas from and then provide a couple of quick examples. First from open infrastructure, 
which is a, a conversation that's still active uh, and developing. Uh, but we've, what we've borrowed is this heightened sense that the services, protocols, standards, and software should empower and invite communities to participate in the building, not just of the project and, and, and not just building, but also maintenance uh, of workflows and skill sets and policies and procedures that surround the work. Uh, so one way that we uh, thought about that was that um, from the outsource, uh, from the outset of the project, the cohort would be a part of um, uh, building, advising, developing, testing, and utilizing everything that we all co-created together. So we foregrounded the cohort as this community of practice uh, and facilitated sharing throughout the project and are still uh, finding new ways to do that as we're going toward the close. Um, we also decided early on that um, the, the content and the tools and infrastructure are important parts of the project, but we wanted to make sure also that documentation is thought of as a primary output from the grant. So that's why we have, and you can see there the link to our Open Science Framework repository. We've really thought deeply about documentation as, um, as essential to the project. Uh, also, in, in, the, in terms of delivery and dissemination, we chose to deliver all the content except for uh, one project that has a technical dependency on the web also for maximum responsiveness and accessibility. So we're sort of trying to stake this good practice claim that even for situated physical experiential works, an online component is also critical. For public and community engaged scholarship, another, uh, another lens through which um, our broader community is working, we adopted this ethos of interpretation and translation as essential and central to the project. So one great example of that is that our creative residents, Caitlin and Misha, um, worked very closely with our local USGS office on uh, the preparation of uh, surface tension, the uh, prototype of the project you see right there. And also there, were, there just happened to be a, um, a, a water resources conference that happened during the time that they were here. So they went and sort of had a table uh, in the corner of the, um, the, the expo center for that conference. Uh, another example is that we have several living and learning communities in our uh, uh, on campus at NC State. Uh, so we tried um, to make sure that our residents were integrated uh, into those living and learning communities, uh, often through a, through a talk or a, or a Q and A session. So Lucas Swick, for example, went and presented at the uh, the Artist Village. So we we're trying to find ways to. Um, not just make things within the university, but invite the community of the university and the community beyond the university to, to work with us in the idea space that we're building. From the area of uh, principles-based research production, we inherited this impulse to infuse our project with values uh, of justice, of valuing labor, responsible stewardship. Uh, how this played out, and Shelby mentioned a few of the projects already, and we purposefully chose and crafted our call for proposals based on projects that were um, dealing with uh, contemporary and important social issues like food and housing insecurity, uh, the Me Too movement, or water access. Uh, coming out from our uh, um, observance of what's happening in the digital humanities especially, we thought it was very important to uh, find ways to um, attribute the labor that's been involved in the project. So we developed a, a contributorship data model and methodology, which we're now going back and um, refreshing and applying to um, each of the residency projects, but also to the project overall. Who did what? How were they involved? Um, finding ways to make sure to um, that it wasn't just the three PIs that, that did this work. There was a, a broad group of people and we can describe uh, how and, and what they were involved in. And then finally, I th uh, thinking back to the uh, um, MIT Future of Libraries report, uh, this concept of the library as a global open platform, uh, we've actually begun to reimagine the physical building, the James B. Hunt Library, as a container for these scholarly works, much in the same way that a, a, a journal or a monograph or a, or a platform uh, are the containers that we're starting to understand uh, as um, delivery of scholarly works. The library itself, I think, can be one of those uh, containers. And so what we, decisions that we've tried to make are how can we give 
um, these works in our library as many markers of that containerized knowledge as possible, but still say that um, the, the, the premier uh, um, way to, for you to engage with this work is in the building, and here's all the other ways that you can also engage with that work. So for us, citability was, was something that was really important, which was a reason that we decided to use the Open Science Framework. So all, um, all the products of the, uh, the grant, including the projects, the content themselves, are, are citable with DOIs clearly indicated in online and scholarly venues as we share the work broadly. Uh, it felt really um, uh, helpful and useful for us to uh, in, engage in peer review in some way. So we submitted the Immersive Scholar Project to the uh, newly launched journal Reviews in Digital Humanities. And you can see the, the DOI for the review of our project that was published uh, in early March. And then finally, and this is where the thought space we're in right now is we're, we're still um, thinking about what it means to publish. What does it look like to publish these kinds of works? So we're in conversations with our colleagues at UNC Press to discuss what, how do you even do this sort of thing? What does it look like to publish an experiential works of scholarship um, that exists in the same way in a primarily text-based system, but is a very different kind of thing? But underscore again, so Shelby and I sort of worked on our, our sections of the project separately and then, and then put them together. And we both came up independently with the same uh, challenges. Oh, I forgot this slide. This is basically a, um, uh, a concept for what pub a publishing workflow might look like for, for these kinds of works, where it's created at one library uh, and then displayed and then sort of shared out in this network or this cohort or community to be displayed and shared in different ways which creates a distance from the project. And then there's some sort of certification that happens maybe through a university press, which applies some authority. And then a different library would say, okay, well, that's something that's valuable to us. So this is a concept that we're developing out of the um, Immersive Scholar project. So those challenges that, uh, that Shelby mentioned were the exact same ones that I came up with uh, without kind of uh, comparing notes until we we're compiling the slides together. And they are, they are the same. How do, how do we sustain this kind of work? How do we sustain the technology? But also how do we sustain um, new content? Uh, how do we um, allow for ephemerality of these kinds of things where they don't need to exist forever, but there should be a way to refer to the thing as it existed at a certain point in a certain place. Uh, we're thinking uh, deeply and broadly about the shareability of these things. Yes, it's great to have uh, large walls and screens, but what does it look like to scale down to a, uh, a cell phone or, or um, to deliver it uh, in a static web environment or low tech distribution? Um, and then finally, the uh, what is this, the scholarshipness of this of these things? The best example we have is that um, our 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 colleague Mary Haskett, um, who did that that study about food and housing insecurity at NC State, she needed a certain um, degree of scholarshipness for the the work that she did. But Lucas Swick, who is our our artist who came to do a residency with us, um, who you know he 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 works as a developer and he's a code artist. Um, for him, citation impact isn't something that matters in the same way. So we have to think about balancing the um, the impact needs of different kinds of uh, people who come together to work on a single thing. So to close, I'll say that I think we've learned, uh, and to uh, underscore what Shelby said, we've learned quite a bit about the development and display of this kind of work. Uh, and I'd say right now we have a really great baseline for how to document and describe um, the, the works themselves and the work that went into it, the labor. And we're experimenting and exploring what dissemination of these kinds of works can look like. That I think will be a little different than what we've understood to be digital scholarship projects or digital humanities works, or especially journal articles and uh, data sets and other things that are being shared right now. Uh, so that, that's the conclusion of the presentation and we're happy to hang around and take as many questions as you all have. Um, Diane has just put in the chat that you can put them in the Q&A box or we're happy to take them in the chat um, over on the, the Zoom window and I'll mute for a second. Thank you very much for listening. Thanks, Micah. Thanks, Shelby. That was a fascinating talk, a really interesting topic, and uh, lots to chew on there. Uh, lots of interesting graphics and pictures, too, from your fabulous library. So thank you. Really appreciate that. And I want to uh, thank you again for coming to CNI, and I want to welcome all of our attendees for joining us today. 
uh, as Micah called your attention to the chat box, he put out some useful pointers for you to explore uh, the Immersive Scholars uh, website, which is a fascinating website, has lots of great tools and resources there. So I hope you'll check that out. And it looks like we have our first question in the Q&A. So let me go ahead and read that to you. How has such communicated scholarship, experiential scholarship, the projects themselves, not immersive scholar as a project, been received in RTP processes? You mentioned the citability, but not necessarily the publication aspect. Shelby, you mind if I take a stab first? Um, so the, the, the quick answer to the question is that it hasn't because the, the people that we worked with, the creative residents, um, only two of them were actually appointed in, uh, in universities where that would be necessary. And both of them came from uh, media arts world. So this is kind of par for the course mm -hmm. for their kind of work. So what we were doing, so that was, that was an affordance that we knew. So what we did is started to think about um, if we were working with a historian, for example, um, what, what would need to be documented to make the case for this to be in a, a promotion binder. So that's where that, that documentation as a primary scholarly output came from, is we were, we were utilizing the, the artists and the media um, scholars that we worked with uh, to think about a way that we could document these projects that might be helpful for the, the next historian or chemist or uh, um, someone who's on the tenure track who needs to make a case for this. Uh, so so we've developed a, yeah, a sense of a broad documentation and also contextualization, thinking about the, the public engagement of these works. And, and we know now that publicly engaged works still aren't really rising on a person's CV or um, being um, included in tenure and promotion binders in the same way as a peer reviewed publication. But the more we put them on those, uh, the more that uh, I think that they will start to, um, yeah, they'll start to be uh, recognized in different ways. Great, thank, thank you, Micah, and thank you for that question. We have another question now uh, that comes from another anonymous questioner. Are you looking at best practices of documenting social practice or community engaged art practices as one way to capture this work? Do you wanna take it, Micah, or I can? <laughs> sure, uh, you go first. I, I have a thought, but go ahead. Sure, so, um... I think, yes, in, in some aspects, um, this has definitely been a learning experience. And so unfortunately, some of the situations we were not able to capture in the moment. And I think figuring out, is there a way to translate that to something that is capturable, even without the physical person there. But then um, some of the components of the projects had built in things that were more easy to capture. And so it was easier to start thinking through some of those practices for community engaged art pieces um, surrounding their engagement type events. Um, but I think that we do have a lot to learn. And I think that, that art practices are an area that was really helpful for us to have an artist um, join us that is in a scholarly sphere because she was able to explain a lot of those practices to us, um, just like Micah was saying about giving credit for that work. Um, yeah, Micah, I'm sure you have more thoughts on this than I do. Uh, yeah. So. Um... In our in our documentation hub, we one of the documents that we worked on was these um, guidelines for how to talk about this kind of work, especially for promotion and tenure. So we worked with a um, a colleague named Dr. Abby Mann, who's a, a student at our. Um, UNC Chapel Hill uh, library school, whatever it's called anyway. Um, what she found in, in kind of addressing the question directly is that there is actually are a lot of guidelines in performance art, uh, and I, I'd include um, social practice art as, as on, a, on a side of a performance art there, that will be really, really helpful for us in thinking about these things as, as happenings or experiences that um, are meant to be ephemeral and finding ways to um, to document them, borrowing from those established practices in the performance arts and theater or in things like social practice. So we've written some of that into the documentation. Uh, and I think we're anxious for the, the next resident or the next person who does a version of this project to utilize some of that documentation and see how, um, uh, yeah, how it's applied in, in different ways. Great, that's interesting. And uh, thank you very much for that question. 
And we do have a little more time if people have uh, questions, just go ahead and type them in the Q&A box there or feel free to chat it out. Uh, I have one chat that wants to thank you for the great talk and we have another question that's just come in. Could you elaborate a little bit more about conversations with the UNC Press? I would love to. Um, um, they are just conversations. So uh, the director of the press, John Scherer, and I have been uh, colleagues for a while, and we tend to be in the same rooms often thinking about big ideas. And so he actually invited me over to the press uh, early January to do a presentation for, that, for, for his colleagues at the press about these kinds of works that are a really particular and unique kind of um, research output that that especially our library, NC State, is involved in that um, isn't necessarily reflect, reflected in the same way across the rest of our um, library system. Um, so it's 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 just a conversation, but uh, they're they're intrigued, I'll say, by um, by the challenges that this represents, um, and I I think that we have a lot of good knowledge and models from a lot of the digital publishing that's happening and you know university of michigan press stanford uh has the, their digital um imprint uh and brown at the same time um as as we're involved with them has a, a, a separate grant working on digital publishing so there's a lot we know about um digital publishing already but i think most of what we know about it right now is focused on the thing that we have called a monograph for a long time and the things that we're creating are not that uh, so we're we're having these really uh, yeah high level early just discussions with the press about well what does this look, what does this look like UNC Press is our press also um, what would it look like for us to establish some sort of a partnership with them for that um, lending that that stamp of of certification which which is valuable uh, in this in you know raising those things up on someone's uh, tenure and promotion binder for sure oh that's really fascinating looking forward to hearing what's going to come out of those conversations. Thank, thanks for that question and thanks for that great answer, Micah. Um, well, it looks like we are close to the end of our time here. Uh, if you do have any more questions, please feel free to type them in now. Um, I'm just going to share out with everyone the direct uh, link to the program for the rest of CNI's virtual Spring 2020 membership meeting. So you can take a look at that link um, to find out what else we have coming. We have a full month left of, um, of webinars, and we hope that you will join us for more. We appreciate you spending time with us here today. Uh, seeing no more questions pop up in the, in the box now, I will propose to turn off the recording and end the public portion of this presentation and just invite uh, and any attendees who are still with us if you're interested in sort of approaching the podium and having um, a casual chat with Shelby and Micah we'll hang around here a little bit longer just if you just raise your virtual hand I'll know that you want me to turn your microphone on I'd be happy to do that and uh, just check what check out with them uh, some more about what they've been working on and if you've got projects you're thinking about implementing at your institution this would be a good time to uh, come up and chat with them so on behalf of CNI, thank you so much for joining us. Thank you, Shelby and Micah, and uh, be well, everyone. Yes, thank you all. Mm -hmm.